Good afternoon and thank you Shashi for that kind introduction. Um, uh, I was supposed to be the first speaker, so there will be some overlap in slides, so obviously I won't uh, dwell too long on them. Uh, the interesting part will be that I'll be talking about a case who has hypertriglyceridemia, who presents with acute coronary syndrome and interspersed with it um, the data that we have to support the use of sarcoclitazar. Uh, I think this has already been covered that uh, the CVD death rates are higher in patients with diabetes and I think you can see very well that as the number of um, risk factors increase, so does the death rate increase proportionately and if we take the overall causes of death in people with diabetes, then it is almost 65% due to combination of coronary artery disease with cerebrovascular disease. Here we are, about 65%. And this is now from uh, Anoop's data, the clinical findings in insulin resistance. Now these are simple phenotyp phenotypic markers for insulin resistance in Asian Indians. Number one, acanthosis nigricans. Number two, a buffalo hump, which of course, which we always thought of as seen only in um, Cushing's, but it is, it is described with insulin resistance. A double chin, sorry, this is sort of not sort of moving the way, uh, the, as the speed that I would like to, and to move, so I'm sorry for this uh, little hindrance. Uh, perhaps the cell needs to be changed after my talk. Then you can see the truncal skin fold as well as the hepatomegaly, uh, the fatty liver that uh, Himant was uh, alluding to earlier. Uh, insulin resistance and dyslipidemia, if you consider the pathophysiology in insulin re resistance, we have accelerated free fatty acids as well as triglyceride production and we have increased at the end of this in the small dense atherogenic LDL. So this is what we are trying to improve. Now talking of insulin resistance, thank you. Okay. Now if we want to improve insulin resistance in any patient, we can use both the non-pharmacologic as well as the pharmacological measures. Lifestyle, obviously for the non-pharmacological and smoking cessation. In the pharmacologic measures, we can use insulin sensitizers. I'll be talking about these as I go along with the patient that I will be discussing. Then the lipid lowering agents like statins, then the non-statin lipid modifiers and the newest option that we have which is being used for the last year and a half, that is saroglitazar. Um, Himant has already told you the differences, uh, the advantages of the role of PPR, gamma and alpha in insulin resistance. So um, the alpha would have a primary improvement in the lipid profile, whereas the gamma, the primary effect is in the insulin sensitivity. Now this patient presented in March last year, a 48 year old male in the coronary care unit with symptoms of ACS, acute coronary syndrome and was diagnosed as non, non NSDEMI while he was in the ICU, he was not a known diabetic, he was diagnosed with diabetes with an HbA1c of 7.6, a deranged fasting and a postprandial, the liver and the renal functions were normal, the echocardiography ejection fraction of 62%. At presentation, lipids were deranged as expected, total cholesterol 210, LDL 120, HDL 36, triglycerides 240 and the non-HDL 174. Insulin was started in the ICU, but the patient did not want to continue it subsequently and metformin was prescribed at discharge, 
A Torvald statin 40 mg, Ramipril and the typical combination aspirin, clopidogrel as well as metoprolol. Now as far as the drug, first drug in all the algorithms for prescription in management of diabetes, we all agree is metformin and UKPDS has, UKPDS has already demonstrated long term benefits with this. We know that we would not use it in CKD and if there is absolute vitamin B12 deficiency. This patient is dyslipidemic. Categorically, statins will be the first line. That was one of the questions just addressed into after the earlier talk. We will never, we will not stop the statins by any means, even if we are going to add saroglitazar later. And we have trials that have categorically demonstrated a significantly reduced CV risk. ADA tells us that we should give statins for all type 2 diabetics above the age of 40. Now, in this gentleman, a month later, the patient is stable. There are no features of angina. The fasting and the post the blood glucose values are now within acceptable limits. The LDL is down to 80. We could still bring it lower. HDL is 38. The triglyceride has gone up. The total cholesterol is within the normal, almost within the normal range. If we want it below 150, that would be more ideal. And the same treatment is continued. Now, if you look at the values between March and September, that is six months later, the HbA1c is better. The fasting, we're almost near goal. The post branded is still a little elevated, but if we focus on the lipids, though the cholesterol has improved as the LDL, the HDL has shot up a little, but not where we would want it to be. The triglycerides are almost where they were, and the non HDL is still 142. <coughs> now, the patient is on lifestyle metformin and torvastatin. But we have the goal as far as the non-HDL is concerned is still not achieved. Now as far as blood glucose control, what did UKPDS teach us? That after 3 years, 50% of subjects were inadequately controlled and after 9 years, only 25% of patients are controlled. And we know from the legacy effect that we want the control earlier and faster. So after metformin, do we have any other insulin sensitizer available? Now if we talk of the glitazones, I am not going to talk about rosiglitazone here at all. We are not using it and we will not be using it for perhaps quite some time to come. But pioglitazone, there was a significant reduction in MI, stroke and mortality from the proactive study. But we are bogged down by anemia, weight gain, edema, bone fractures and this question mark in relation to bladder malignancy. Now the bottom line of all these stories or studies that I have highlighted here is that the 10 year epidemiological data showed that no association between the usage of bioglitazone and the bladder cancer risk. So that we can be rest assured about. But the other disadvantages remain with glitazone alone. The fracture risk. This is a large group, almost 7,000 individuals with a control group, equal, equally large number, with a almost 40% higher incidence of fractures in both men and women who were exposed to the thiazolidine diodes. Himant, this slide is common. He categorically showed us that the residual CV risk remains, whether we talk of HPS or the CARB study, 78, 68 to 78% residual CV risk remains. Now the PPR agonists and lipids, if we look beyond the LDL, focusing only on the triglyceride and the HDL. Now, in the meta-analysis, there was a 35% significant CV reduction in patient population with a baseline triglyceride of more than 
or equal to 204 with a low HDL. However, we have limitations because the creatinine goes up, there's a derangement in the liver enzymes, there's a risk of cholelithiasis, some myalgia, myopathy, especially with joint fibrillosin statin combination. What about saroglitazar? Can we use it as a newer option for the management of talking of insulin resistance in association with dyslipidemia in type 2 diabetes? Yes, after the review of literature, it has been approved for the treatment of diabetic dyslipidemia and hypertriglyceridemia. The question that was asked after the earlier talk, can we use it for primary hypertriglyceridemia only off-label? And in that now, I think we, I'm talking of individuals who are not controlled on statin therapy alone. If we look at the reduction in the insulin sensitivity, there's a 91% reduction at 1 milligram per kilogram. And again, even with the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp study, which is the gold standard, there's an improvement in the insulin resistance. We have published phase 3 clinical trials. The PRESS 6 trial, which is a multi-center, prospective, randomized, double-blind study, evaluating the safety and efficacy of both the 2 and the 4 milligram compared with the placebo in type 2 diabetes having hypertriglyceridemia which is not controlled with a statin alone and the other it was, these are all very recent studies obviously because this is a newly launched drug and the second is a multi-center prospective randomized double blind study to evaluate the safety and efficacy compared to pioglitazone a large dose of 45 milligrams in diabetic dyslipidemia. So it was shown in both these studies to be safe regarding cardiac parameters, liver function, renal function, CPK and there was no edema or weight gain. And added to that over two years preclinical data there is no evidence of carcinogenicity. So let's come back to our patients again. Now six months down the line, HbA1c is almost near goal. The fasting too as well as the postprandial. The creatinine is normal. But look at the triglycerides. They are still 236 non-HDL 142. So the patient lifestyle is intensified. Metformin continues as does atorvastatin along with the other drugs. But we have now added saroglitazar 4 milligrams. Now, December. So at the end of the year, 3 months later, the blood glucose targets are all within range. Yes, even the triglycerides are now below 150 and the non-HDL up to 110. So addition has made a significant difference and which we were not able to achieve earlier. And remember, a person who has been admitted into the ICU is going to be one motivated patient. So from March to December, he was not able to achieve this by lifestyle alone in addition to an insulin sensitizer. No adverse events, no weight gain and edema. So the insulin resistance we know is a very, very important, long-standing, underlying cause of diabetes and the associated comorbidities. Undoubtedly, metformin will be the first insulin sensitizer of choice. Pyoglitazone definitely is a very, very important insulin sensitizer, but we know there are patients in whom we cannot prescribe it because of the side effects. Statins are here to stay and they are the first line management of this lipidemia especially diabetic dyslipidemia, but if there is a residual hypertriglyceridemia, non-HDL components are not back to range, then do we have a good option? Certainly. It is effective for lowering fibrates. Unfortunately, they are effective for lowering the CV risk in patients with a hypertriglyceridemia, but they have certain limitations. 
and sarugliturzar, it has been approved by DCGI for the treatment of only diabetic dyslipidemia and I have shown you that the pivotal phase 3 clinical trials have shown significant improvement in the lipid parameters, some glycemic parameters without disadvantages, without gastritis, dyspepsia, pyrexia, asthenia, which these are the most commonly reported adverse events. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to invite you for two meetings for which I am the scientific chair. One is the Uttar Pradesh Diabetes Association, 10th and 11th October in Jim Corbett Park.